The only thing I could think of that could be sadder or worse than the passing of a wrestling legend is another Monday night on the USA Network. Jim, I understand you watched Raw this week. Well, and you know, we can't be that unfair because as Raw goes, this was not a rotten Raw. They, this was at least half-baked. Uh, there was a couple of things I actually enjoyed and at least some hope for the future. And apparently, as we'll mention also here at some point in the program, they're on a ratings roll. And they were back up here to almost 2 million on the fast, overnight, international number game, whatever they fucking send out. We haven't heard from Thurston Howell the third, you and I. We haven't uh, officially, but it seems like the raw numbers were up also. And they were at the Hartford Civic Center, which looked great. It was packed, looked great, right down the road from Stamford. That's apparently why they had numerous visitors, including the leader of the evil empire himself. His hot air balloon landed in the parking lot. Vince McMahon was there. Apparently not being too overbearing. They said he changed the the order of matches around, but I don't think he rewrote everything from scratch this week. You know what's the biggest sign he's not being overbearing? The panting announcer. <laughs> we always hear about Vince screaming in everyone's ear. Mick Foley quit because he couldn't put up with the screaming from Vince McMahon. Vince micromanages and yells, Michael Cole would be a five-star announcer if not for Vince screaming at him. Then how does this guy get on this show? Just, oh, that breath, Kevin Owens, oh, he's panting. He's just panting. And then he like just says names and nicknames and back to the panting. I can't deal with this fucking guy. Loud noises. Oh, oh look, and parry him. Oh, oh, how is Vince allowing that? For everyone who wants to say Vince micromanages and screams at these guys, how is that getting on Raw? Well, see, the th that's the way they talk over across the pond. <gasps> Don't you know that? Oh, oh, it's oh. the queen. Oh, oh, it's the queen. Oh, it's the prince. Oh, oh, it's the count. Oh, it's the count and his wife. The oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what they say over there. I'm just telling you. They say that word a lot. It means different things over there across the pond. It's like he's kissing someone under a tree. Like just, <laughs> like, oh, 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 look at, oh. And Corey I Graves, don't know. I don't and Corey Graves is trying to make his voice deeper to get away from that. He was like, I don't know what you're doing. You know, he can tell he's trying not to do that. Well, I don't think that you make those noises from kissing and they'd be muffled anyway. Because <laughs> if your mouth was cut, I think you're, oh, you're getting a full-fledged fucking old-fashioned under the tree over there if, the visionary, <sighs> Seth he's, freaking Rollins, just says names and pants. I can't deal with it. He's having visions. <laughs> at, le at least the announcer's not the one seeing red fucking lights shining in his window. It's more orange, more orangey right. red, and uh, the wind is just, the trees are blowing all over the place, and the sky is red. Wait a it's minute, like you got an orange reflection through the window and a bunch of fucking hot air blowing? Have you checked to see if Trump's in your driveway? Uh, you know, Bedminster's right over here, so that's not an outrageous thought. But no, it's just, it looks like the fallout after the apocalypse out here right now. But anyway. Back to, but back to Raw. Back to Raw. So Seth Franklin, he's one of the, he's one of those uh, new world champions you hear about. They got so many of them now. He's world champion number three. And he comes out to do the in-ring promo at the start of the program. And he's growling now, too. In addition to laughing and cackling ah! and dancing and prancing, he's growling. And it's been two years since there's been a world heavyweight championship match on Raw. Even though that two years ago, his title did not even exist. But nevertheless, we get the point. But he says that's too long, so he's issued an open challenge tonight. And it's been answered by Damian Priest. And just then, Judgment Day music plays, because here comes the aforementioned Davian Priest, Dav Davian? Damian Priest and Finn Balor. <laughs> and together they say that, you know, they did some scripted funny stuff and prompt the fans to sing to fill some time, because 
There was nothing wrong with this interview. Nobody got lost and the fans liked it. It's just that, again, everything said here could have been said, done, accomplished in so much less time, right? Between the long entrances and the long musical interludes and et cetera. But a priest sounds like an adult, which is refreshing. And the way he did his promo, it was... It was a babyface promo. And as well, he, you know, he said he didn't need his group to beat Seth Franklin Rollins. And later on, that will tie in in our, our main event of the evening. But should they, I guess they're at least teasing some dissension. And should they be doing that now when they're operating the bloodline story where we're trying to figure out who's on whose side should another group be not on the same page amongst themselves brian i think if the bloodline's going to be exclusive to smackdown it's okay to have something that's exclusive to raw and the judgment day have eaten up a lot of tv time there's someone from the women's division the champion dominic could do single stuff or team up with one of these guys and then these guys could both team up or do single stuff so I'm okay with doing something like that here if the bloodline's not going to be over here mostly. Yeah, but then does Damian Priest become a babyface in this? I think if Vince McMahon was involved or if anyone's been paying attention, they would probably think that beyond Rhea Ripley, Damian Priest is someone they could elevate and do something with, whether they'll do it the right way or the wrong way. That remains to be seen. The WWE way would all of a sudden be for him to start smiling a lot. So if you start <laughs> noticing he's smiling more, he will be their baby face. Well, the thing is, I'm I'm thinking, as you said, if they are paying attention, they see him as a guy they need to elevate. But I think it it would be as a top heel more longer, and then it should be. But nevertheless, again, this wasn't bad; just a little long. And then Seth said, "I will see you in the main event." Oh, and I'm sorry, Seth made uh, Damien agree to leave the Judgment Day in the back. And Damien, he didn't make him, Damien did. Straight up like a man against Finn's, apparently against his better thoughts, because he reacted to that. So Judgment Day will be in the back, it's going to be one-on-one, -on -one, and Seth said, see you in the main event, and I swear to God, what is that Monty Python routine, the Ministry of Funny Walks? <laughs> or, That's right. Did you see it? John Cleese, yeah. No, I mean, did you see Seth Franklin Rollins do the John Cleese? Yes! Funny, what, what the... <laughs> we marm the order of men whom hum between words, hmm? Again, he's a visionary, a revolutionary. What is the vision... That is so revolutionary, other than a guy who needed something and now just acts like a wacky, just acts like a guy whacked out on PCP. That's all it is. <laughs> That's all it is. I don't know. I've seen some of those fucking police videos of the people on PCP, and they don't seem to be nearly having as much fun as he is. The people love the music, and they like reacting to the music. That's one of the big things with wrestling right now. It's about that kind of experience more than actually sitting there and reacting to any of the matches. You sit there in silence and you watch any of the actual wrestling you get on these shows. But they like his shtick. You know, when he's serious, I like him. I buy him. But when he's out there talking like superstar Billy Graham or whatever the fuck he's trying to do, I don't believe <laughs> any of it. It's just a guy performing. Billy Graham, you believed, was kind of this... You know, this guy who thought he was bigger than life. Look at him. He kind of was this guy yeah. who thought he was bigger than life. Yeah. I don't buy it from Franklin. Franklin ain't selling you, huh? Nope. Is he selling you? He ain't selling me. Not with with the work is fine. Not with the, uh, I don't know what the fuck's going on with, as you, you know, as you said, the PCP business. But you wouldn't think he'd be able to pass the uh, the test then, the wellness check that they do, all that PCP. What happens with the wellness program with the merger? Well, that's an interesting... Have we heard anything about the uh, wellness program lately? I haven't heard a word of... I haven't even heard the word wellness <laughs> in quite a while, no. I've heard the word sickness a number of times. <laughs> All right, moving on into the sickness. Uh, I wasn't down with the next sickness, the Money in the Bank qualifier for the women's portion of the program. 
Um, and again, I registered my displeasure that every time they have a stipulation match, they had to have one for the girls too, and put it on before the guys to just dull your appetite. So Becky wrestles Cruella. And Cruella DeVille looks so good. Why does she, and they featured her as the crooked executive with Pierce for a while, et cetera. But why does she just always do jobs? I don't know that she's ever won a match in recent memory. Maybe I'm wrong, but didn't she have some kind of background too originally? Like an MMA or something? Or maybe not MMA. I'll double check, but at least training. I think, I think you need to, to check on that. Because if she had the, the the MMA experience, then she'd be teamed up with Ronda instead of Shayna. It'd be Ronda and Cruella. But nevertheless, it doesn't matter because Becky won with a rock bottom like thing, and we moved on. They did a big SmackDown Bloodline recap of all of that drama, and if you haven't heard about that, well, by cracky, it's up on YouTube now. On our channel, not theirs. Don't watch it. Just listen to us talk about it. Hey, uh, under her real name, yes, she has a record of one, one, and one. One, uh, actually, excuse me, three. One, wait a minute, is it one, <laughs> one, one, three, 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 <laughs> six, 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 or nine, I'm, nine, I'm nine? I'm trying to read it the way they have it here. It's all fucked up. She has won two fights and lost one. She won one by knockout, one by submission. Well, goddamn. Seems like she could handle some of these girls then, doesn't it? Anyway, so somehow, I wasn't, because again, I saw, I'm fast forwarding to get to the next match. And I see Owens and Zane, and then uh, they're in the back standing by the anvil cases or whatever. But here comes Gunther and his stooges, and basically he pisses off Kevin Owens, who now is apparently noted for his insane temper, just the uncontrollable, maniacal fury that he breaks out into whenever he loses control of himself. You've heard this many times about Owens. Yeah, I guess this outweighs the pacifist in Sami Zayn. Yes, he, you, got, you got an unstable maniac on one side and a, a pacifistic... Individual on the other side, trying to keep them calm. The same insane connection. Uh, you've, you're doing the market. Yeah, this is creative services stuff. <laughs> Where the fuck is the notepad? We don't need to call creative. Said Debbie Bonanzio over creative services. That's who Vince would want to get on the phone. Anyway, so Owens just says, come on, let's fight. And he storms out to the ring with Zane in tow. For a match that he apparently just decided they should have on this national television program. And as he's walking out there, the announcer's like, well, I hope somebody makes this official. And son of a bitch, wouldn't you know who won the pony, Brian? They made it official. I couldn't believe, I thought it was going to be a lot of red tape going through a lot of fucking governmental hoops and ladders and etc but no boom it was done so i watched this because i love gunther and old ko can go when he wants to be a fucking a team player but you know i'm I've, I've got to put owens over because i think physically he looks the best he's ever looked now you may say cornet that's faint praise because Owens went to, did you hear about this when he went to a plastic surgeon? No. He went to a plastic surgeon. He said, Doc, make me look like I did 20 years ago. The doctor said, what, you want me to put the tail back on? Oh, stop it. So anyway. You'd be nice. Well, I'm trying. So anyway, <laughs> he does physically look better than he had, and it's not a rib. He still looks like shit compared to all the tanned oiled guys that go to the gym but he's easily 30 pounds lighter or more than he was in the ring of honor days when we asked him to lose weight and he's tattooed his pale flabby arms to the point where even though he doesn't or can't tan there all of the really white pale skin with stretch marks is covered up with tattoos and even though his gear is still somewhat baggy 
they make him wash it and it all matches. Do you remember what we used to deal with when he was in Ring of Honor, when he would come out there with the fucking the furniture disease where his chest was in his drawers and just wearing whatever baggy stretch shit that he had and we couldn't get him to even trim the beard. So the point is they've done what they can with him here and he's apparently cooperated with it and he don't look as bad as he used to. But he could always work. That's what the issue was. And he could work here and Gunther's great. And again, they work this where they're portraying Gunther as a dominant physical force that usually carries the fight to the opponents and the opponent has to sell and fight back from underneath and Owens did a great job of that because he can sell and he can fight back from underneath. They still went to break when they started the thing in two minutes, for fuck's sake, but they kept a pace up. And again, Gunther's good, he's solid, he's aggressive. He explodes when he needs to with whether it be the chop or the clothesline or whatever and then slows it back down and is deliberate and acts like a heel. And they got a long, old-fashioned heat on Owens where he would get hope spots. He would try to fight back. He would succeed in fighting back. But before he could make his comeback, Gunther had shut him back down. So he was still in the underneath position. And then, again, there was a part where Owens finally reversed a German. They were both down. They traded forearms. Gunther shut him down again. But then he made the mistake of toying with him, and Owens was up with a flurry of super kicks and the cannonball in the corner where he puts his ass in the guy's face upside down. Good Lord, that, that potentially should be deadly. And he got a two count with that, but then they start going back and forth. And finally, again, they built to the finish. They didn't do all their big shit until at the last, as they should be. Owens went to the top. Or no, Owens hit a fisherman buster, as they call it, and got a two count. Owens went to the top, but Gunther hit the superplex two count. Gunther went to the top and came off, but Owens got his knees up on the splash, and then he went up and hit a swanton and got a two count. So they're building them. And then suddenly, one of the Stooges pops up. Sammy jerks him down. Both the Stooges jump Sammy. Owens rolls out on the floor. And they they Owens throws one of the Stooges back in the ring in front of the referee and stunners him. And stands up and Gunther schoolboys him from behind one, two, three. And in fr again, in front of the referee, it, it should have been a disqualification. There was no reason to throw the fucking guy in the ring, except that I'm sure Owens wanted to hit a stunner. And that was the only way he could hit a stunner. But it didn't make any sense to throw the guy in the ring, be active with him, referee standing there and looking at it. And then... Be, be so stupid that you just stand up and the guy schoolboys you from behind one, two, three. So it was a really good match with a rotten finish that just came out of nowhere. Yeah, I mean, I can't add too much to it other than I think the, I think the match was an interesting match. People were really into it. We heard from people that wanted you to watch it. The fans got really into it. And although it's a preposterous setup, and again, just all of a sudden, angry Kevin Owens, what? <laughs> oh, 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 let's go! And he just creates a match. He storms off. You know, the, you know, the guy's panting while Kevin's screaming. <laughs> and yeah, it's usually the way that it happens. Kevin starts screaming, the other guy's panting. And then, usually those are the guys in the office, though. Uh, but then, you know, even like the Imperium, how many times is this guy, Wilhelm or whatever his name is, going to walk up just slowly, gentle, like he's extending gentlemen. <laughs> to an unnatural degree that is getting silly. Well, and that's that's what they've done with the Stooges. They they yeah. don't win anything or if they do fluke win something, it's over underneath people. They get beat up two on one by upper baby faces and generally just there to make a nuisance of themselves. You can't take them seriously of their, of their own accord. Now with that said, once 
Gunther showed up in the middle of them, exposing or kind of giving away that they're not going to do a tag team match, thank God. Because again, they always lose. You know what you're going to get. Yeah. You realize you're going to get a Gunther match. It's going to be one of these guys. If it's happened, I haven't seen it, but I was intrigued by Gunther Owens, and they did it right away. We did hear that Vince, one of the things he did work on was the the arrangement of the segments. The order of events, as we say in the industry. What went where? So you have to wonder, maybe in the original script, this wasn't going to happen right away. Maybe it was to set up something later in the show, but, you know, the, the setup was preposterous, but having the match right away kind of gave it some spirit. Where it, it didn't helped expect, it. Yeah. And the fans You, did, you didn't it. have all that time to... Literally, between the first segment setting something up for the main event and the main event, you have time to watch Gone with the Wind. And so you forget sometimes. I'm sure we'll get Gunther versus Sammy one of these weeks. I worry about when it becomes... Well, they already kind of exposed when it becomes a trios feud, who the third party is going to be with Sammy and Owens. But it was a good match. It was the best match on Raw in a while, I think. And you know what? With... With Gunther, um, it, it, he instantly adds a little bit more seriousness when he's involved in something, as you said. And I would love to see Gunther and Sammy because Sammy, when he's in his element and in and everybody's with him, the crowd is a Ricky Morton level seller, and that's what he could get some emotion out of people with Gunther. So at least, you know, something interesting. But unfortunately, they're the tag team champions. We don't want to see them in any tag team matches. And for whatever we want to say about how bad they treat everyone else, at least they're keeping Gunther strong still. Well, yeah, but then after getting beaten up in that match, uh, the next thing they showed was in the back, the Gunther Stooges got both of them beaten up by Riddle himself <laughs> they went and pissed him off and he just he chucked one over a case and put a submission to hold on the other one and they had to pull him off of him the guy was screaming so what they they got beat up in the finish of the match in the arena and then came to the back and one guy beat him up again i rest my case uh did uh, you're happy of course we got new women's tag team champions you know what? I'm not going to shit on any of this because I watched this segment and I found it enjoyable. What? The match? The setup for the match? I mean, look, the backstage segments are ridiculous. Everyone's standing at an angle that no one would ever stand at if you're talking to someone to your right or to your left. Beyond that, I thought it was an okay match. Well, here's my problem. As soon as they came up and stood at all those unnatural <laughs> perpendicular angles... I saw that the new girls that they brought up, what's what's their names? Uh, Can't I Carter and Katie No Chance? See, this is part of the problem. They gave them the stupidest names, and especially in one of those cases, it's counterproductive to do that, but whatever. We'll talk about that in a sec. Well, I saw old Can't I Carter and Katie No Chance standing there next to Shayna and Rhonda, who we are, have established are probably of average female height. I'd say around five, six, five, seven, thereabouts, maybe. Is that average? Well, that's probably average for a, a female in the United States of America. Really? Huh. Well, look it up while I'm fucking bloviating over here. All right. And I see them... And, and they're about six inches shorter than the uh, male interviewer who doesn't appear to be an ex-NBA star, so I don't think he's seven feet tall. Five feet four. Is the... Okay, then they're about average. Five, 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 six. Right? Oh, can't I, Carter and Katie, no chance, are easily six to eight inches shorter than Shayna and Rhonda. And when they got in a ring, they would have to stand tiptoe to be able to peek over the top rope. And I'm the... Here are... The former UFC women's champion and her badass MMA style training partner against these two girls that look like they're 19 years old on spring break and they've just been released from a camp of fucking dwarves. It's it, it just see here's the thing. And Rhonda and Shayna beat them in three minutes. 
And Ronda and Shayna, I've actually liked them as a heel tag team. It's the best use of Ronda in a very long time. Not to say that it's the greatest use of her. But here's the thing. I don't even know. I haven't watched too much of them in NXT. But Katana Chance, which is one of the stupidest names anyone has ever had on the main roster. That's Casey Cananazero. Wait, what now? She was on American Ninja Warrior. I knew her before she got into wrestling because she was on Ninja Warrior. She was able to do this incredibly difficult obstacle course, and she was a star on that show. I don't know what the ratings were, but they had a lot of viewers. I don't know why they would change her name unless they just somehow couldn't license any of that footage. But she's a smaller girl. Well, they could still talk about it. They could not change her name. They could do so many different things. They changed her name. She was on TV. Maybe more people saw her do that than this. I don't know. But that could be used to sell why a smaller girl could do this. She's shown that she has strength. Then can we get her a partner that is tall enough to ride to rides at fucking Six Flags? I've never seen her partner really much before, so I can't argue with you on that. But I thought they were fine for their use here, but... I just don't understand. Change the names of nobodies. Why would you change the name of someone who's been on TV like for weeks before? Not like a one-time thing. She competed in this thing and she was featured for a while. Makes no How sense. How did I miss it? Well, you don't really watch Ninja Warrior, do you? I don't really do that. Or no. American Ninja Warrior, I should and say. And I've her, I've never seen her wrestle. I have seen her box, but no, you haven't. You see, you're being um, crude. She, she's a multi multi sports star. It is getting more and more orange, bright orange, orange outside. It's, you almost said red. It's bright orange now outside. Well, ladies and gentlemen, while Brian is fiddling up there in New Jersey Burns. So back to the Money in the Bank qualifying matches, this time in the men's division. Ricochet against Shaky Nakamura. And at this point, did, did the... Uh, a panting announcer, did he somehow pant out the news that Money in the Bank is at 3 o'clock Eastern? Did I hear I that missed on that. commentary? I missed that because I was probably fast-forwarding. I did not hear that. No, where can is you, it? I don't. Can you look that up? Again, while I am extrapolating at length here on what happened. Yeah, whoa, here it is. It's, uh, it's at here 2.30. Hold on. What? <laughs> the fuck what are they, where are they in fucking newfoundland money in the bank 2023 saturday july 1st special spark spark special special sp sp special spark time a folks. special start time Bring the kids of 3 p.m eastern 12 p.m pacific why live exclusively on peacock in the united states where is it from that's what i'm trying to figure well, out yeah well that's exactly what i'm where is it from Time and location, it just has a date. Hold on. Nome, Alaska? What the fuck's going on? 2023. It will be coming from, disseminating from London, England. That makes sense. Well, how did we miss this factoid? We were spending so much time thinking about Wembley, we didn't focus on whoever the hell, the, the O2 Arena. We just don't listen to the announcers. The O2 Arena is a big building. How many people are going to going to go to this event well from what one would figure probably all of them because they say they don't get any big events in the uk so they're giving them every big event they can captain all right well anyway it's going to be and that's a, on a saturday afternoon correct correct Correct. Nothing, right, like well, fall, nothing like watching people fall off ladders under their head on a Saturday afternoon. Well, already that's going to be an issue for you after Saudi Arabia when you say, I just can't watch this in the middle of the day. <laughs> but hey, the, you just can't. I can like around 4, 5 p.m. That's kind of like, OK, let's let's get something going. Yeah, so. you're not ready for any kind of violence until after four o'clock in a day. We'll let all potential home invaders know when to engage you. I'm ready. All right, so anyway, back to Ricochet and Shaky Nakamura. They're, they have the match that they had, and they're fighting on the top rope, and suddenly Bronson Reed comes out and just runs in the ring and attacks them and beats them both up. The referee rings the bell, calls the whole thing off. Let's call the whole thing off. 
And Reed splashes Ricochet off the top rope, and that looks great. What a fucking splash. I'm nervous for his knees over a long period of time, but it looks great, and he stands up and leaves, and they're laying there two grease stains on the canvas. <laughs> grease stains on the canvas of life. So that's what happened there. But now who, what, what, is there an opening now in the Money in the Bank match, or do they just drop one of the seven or eight people in it? I don't know. I don't know if they panted that explanation. <gasps> <sighs> All right. How? Oh! See, I ought to be there. When he went, oh, 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 then I could go, how? Oh! And then people could make loops of, oh, oh, oh. see, the, oh! the question oh, is, oh, do they oh, tell him oh! be out of breath, or is it like his choice? Is he like, you know, I think I have a great idea. I'll just always be out of breath. <laughs> He's <laughs> like the, the harried Britisher. <gasps> that you see in the movies in the 60s when he's, he's cup stomp. all the flutter. Oh, cup stomp. <sighs> <sighs> he's probably well, pumping the I desk. Was, I don't know what the fuck's happening over there. I was ready to hold my breath on the next segment because you had, you go from the sublime to the ridiculous, from the outhouse to the penthouse, you had the Miz TV with Cody Rhodes. So... You can look at it, whereas it, it it would probably be the worst Cody will ever be just because Miz is there, or the best Miz TV will ever be just because Cody's on it. Oh, come on. This was, way you're looking at. This was all right. The Miz, in this usage, the Miz was not a problem here. In this usage. I, I'll, I'll agree with that. But anyway, uh, again, huge pop for Cody. He is... is He's the biggest baby face in wrestling. You can say that Roman is the biggest star and Brock may be per capita the biggest attraction, but Cody's got to be the biggest baby face, right? You say a big pop. They chanted his name. Well, yeah. I mean, just the pop when yeah. they know they're going to see him. And then when he's coming out, they're doing the whoa, whoa, and they're chanting Cody, Cody, and the et cetera. I think one of the lessons of Cody Rhodes over the last several years, and it's played out now perfectly with WWE, is for a lot of wrestlers, treat yourself seriously. Insist that other people will. Cody, Cody forced himself into being a main eventer because he treated himself like one. And this is the payoff right here. Well, and that's, uh, that's rule A. And rule B is even if you do that, you can't fully achieve your potential if you are surrounded by people who are not doing that. Because, again, a presentation has had a lot to do with this. When you can... When Cody was trying to do strong psychological angles or anything that people re were required to think about or etc., like he's been doing here, and the next segment was, you know, chaos with legless people... It 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 wasn't the it wasn't the right what the, the fuck that's a summation <laughs> it's a description I've never heard before chaos with the legless people <laughs> it's it's even worse because you got to see him try to run around oh Johnny um, Eck this week on AEW you know but that's the thing is it it dulls the everything but when he's in a professional environment where it may be silly and it may be childish but it's not just chaotic and fucking everybody just openly shitting on things it means a, a, a different world and he's now the he's gone from one of the top guys for that audience one of the top guys the way he was presented as well in AEW to the biggest baby face in wrestling and survived a goddamn injury where he was out for nine months after he had started it, came came back, picked it up, and has enhanced it. Yes. We were talking about the Miz TV, weren't Miz we? Miz TV with Cody Rhodes. So. With the very popular Cody Rhodes. The very popular. Um, and Miz, of course, say, you look dashing tonight. And I like the way Cody kind of, you know, reacts without reacting to some of the little asides. 
But Miz mentions that, you know, Brock broke your arm and beat you, and you challenged him to show up and fight you anywhere you are appearing. Aren't you stupid? <laughs> and See, I like the Miz here. That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Again, maybe, maybe he needs Cody to produce him. And Cody said, no, 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 I, I'm not stupid. I may be crazy. Maybe it took some balls, and you know a little about that. Of course, they had tiny balls. And basically, Cody, and I think they're probably trying to stretch this to, I don't know where, so what date SummerSlam is this summer, but we need a couple months out of this. So he says Brock is in his, you know, annual hibernation, so we won't see him for a while. And they kind of boo, but we've established that Brock is not coming back immediately because he can't fight him again till his arms well. So we're not going to see Brock again till Cody's arm heals. But Miz has a surprise for Cody because he's invited another multi-generational talent to come out and play. And it's Dominic Mysterio. And here comes Dominic and Mommy. Good old Rhea Ripley. And I like the part where Miz started to speak when we when they got in the ring and, and Rhea said, shut up, Miz. <laughs> Let Dominic speak. No, she didn't. Dom Dom. She never or calls Dom him Dom. Dominic. Okay, Dom I'm Dom. I'm sorry. Let Dom Dom. And of course. And he said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah. But they're doing the thing uh, where every time he tries to talk, they scream over him. And then Rhea obviously protests this and makes it worse. And Dominic had a good line. He called Cody a little birdie with a broken wing. But he said, Cody's a bad father for not being at home, a deadbeat dad, just like his his dad, Ray. And that whole thing. And and Cody came back with Dominic's, I, I know your 15 minutes in prison was, was rough. And that, you know, you had to go through at WrestleMania the public spanking by your dad. But I'll agree with you. I think your father, Rey Mysterio, has made some terrible mistakes. And I'm looking at one of them. And all the people just... <laughs> And again, I, I hear Dusty. I hear Dusty, but at that point, and it, I thought something was going to happen, but now I'm happy that no more happened than this. I thought, are they seriously not going to try to book a match, whatever, here? But when Cody had said that and basically told Dominic off, Dominic, they, they're starting to leave, and Cody turns to... I don't know, get his jacket or acknowledge Miz or whatever he was going to do. And Dominic ran up behind Cody and sucker slapped him and then ran back behind Rhea Ripley and hid behind her so Cody couldn't get to him while she's going, come on, punch me, punch me. And then they backed up out of the ring and Cody did not get the last word on Dominic. While they're backing up and laughing about what they did, Cody turns around, there's Miz standing there and he... Pow, he just levels him with the cast, knocks him out, which was the perfect way to end it. And I'm glad they left this open with, instead of Cody, you know, DDT and Dominic on his head or whatever and kissing Rhea, it, you know, in years past or times past, they may have just said, fuck it, Cody will beat everybody up. But here they left Dominic with his heat. What'd you think of the whole performance? I really liked this segment. I really liked it. The Miz was really good here. They didn't treat him like a main event or anything. They treated him like the Miz. And just a simple shot at the end and him going down. Cody, the way Cody, like, bonked him. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was a perfect ending to this. You took Cody, who got the biggest babyface reaction by far on this show. I guess we could say the biggest babyface reaction we've seen anyone get on either of these shows in a while. And then you bring out the biggest, I don't even know, know if we could say the biggest heel, the guy that people want to treat like the biggest heel. He's the most unpopular guy. Although, I don't want to say they were piping in the boos, but at the very end of the booing, I didn't see anyone standing up when I was looking in the background at now, their faces. I think, here's what they're doing. And if I'm not mistaken, and if, and if I am, somebody could let me know if they were there live in the building. but. What I'm thinking they're doing is whenever that starts with Dominic, they're potting the crowd mics all the way up. So they're 
magnifying what's actually happening rather than putting in fake shit that's not really happening at all. But it, because remember the other day I said they, I think on the AEW show it was they had the crowd mic turned up so loud you could or so far you could hear the people's heartbeats trying to For hear some response. Yeah. yeah. And 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 they're trying to do that with Callus now in AEW. The the Dominic thing they started doing it themselves, and I think that's giving people the idea. Let's let's pick the the most obnoxious heel and not let him talk. But I think they're accentuating the with the level of the crowd mics, depending on what's going on. And Cody and the Miz both lean in like they're listening, like they're trying to hear him. Yeah, if you notice, yeah. which is a nice <laughs> yeah. little touch there. Cody versus Dominic. They didn't give it away. Give it a little bit of time for people to think about it. I don't know if you saw Twitter, but Rhea and Brandy have had an exchange of tweets. Oh, good Lord. My dream feud may be a possibility. <laughs> My, if, if, if Rhea Ripley feud with Brandy Rhodes, first of all, that will turn Rhea to the biggest baby face ever. Second of all, it'll be the greatest feud in the history of wrestling. And both of them can say to the other, I'm mommy, bitch. I don't even want to start guessing what Brandy's promos would be, but I would sign up for that. If you promised me that would be on the show, I would watch it. But you know why I don't think they were going to do it? All, all kidding aside, I don't think Cody could stay the baby face he is with Brandy. Yeah, that that would there would be an element of that. Yeah, and I would love her as a heel because I think she would be a dynamite heel on the mic. You think Dominic's getting booed? Put Brandy out there. <laughs> but we're going to get Cody versus Dominic at some point, and the development of the Dominic Mysterio character and the relationship with Rhea has been fantastic. And just like the bloodline, like I said before about the judgment day, I want to see where all this is going. They didn't get them away from Rhea when she got the world title. All of this is continuing. And Dominic Mysterio's gone from a guy we didn't think had much of a future because he wasn't showing much other than a smile to maybe the most enjoyable heel in the business. Wait, and remember, it looked like that we talked about it, that they may separate Rhea because she was becoming, you know, a big star on her own. But now they're kind of having their cake and eating it, too, because they didn't have to. I, it looked like they were going to switch her baby face because people were cheering for her. They didn't have to. But with her as the women's champion, still a heel so she can still be with Dominic, they still love her, but at the same time, she and Dominic are so great together that there's no need to sabotage that by splitting them up. So we're seeing more Rhea Ripley. That ain't bad. You know what is bad, though, don't you? Another Money in the Bank qualifying <laughs> match. I didn't remember what the next segment was. I wasn't sure. And Natalia and Zoe Stark, and uh, all due respect to Natalia, but again, Zoe won with Trisha's help. And then Paul E. was in the locker room and invites us all to watch Friday on SmackDown to see Jay Uso make the historic choice of uh, who he's going to stand beside. And Paul predicts that he, since part of his job as the wise man is delivering bad news, that the news will rip apart the Anawahi and Fatu dynasties when Jay makes his choice and stands by his brother, Solo. Paul says Jay can share a womb with his twin, not a womb, not a, not a Baba Wawa womb, but a W-O-M-B womb. He can share a womb with his twin, but he's closer to Roman Reigns as his tribal chief, and he will acknowledge that fact or else. So we got a big deal going on on SmackDown. You know, things happen with the bloodline, and you're like, yeah, things are happening, and then it goes right back to the slow pace of, we're going to have another segment to announce <laughs> an announcement. I mean, it'll be good. We'll see what happens. I thought he kind of made his choice, but I guess he didn't. So now we get well, to see no, him make his choice. Remember, Jay didn't, he didn't commit physically to anybody. He just stood around and wrung his hands. And the last thing that we heard was that Roman said Jay's going to fall in line like he always does. That's what he's going to do. He's just speaking for him. Just so you know what happens when you assume, though. When you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. 
My big question remains, how much longer can they go with just the four of them and Heyman? Do they have to get someone else or a couple more people in the mix? I'm thinking they got to they gotta go to the island of relevancy and find the next available candidate for entry into the bloodline. I say Jacob Fatu, who's currently still apparently signed to the island of Ill- irrelevancy. And, um, but nevertheless... So then the the next match was a real, as Lance Russell would say, a stem winder, or perhaps as Gordon Soley would say, a pier six brawl, or JR might say a slobber knocker. It could even be a a whole old fashioned stem winder. Or did I say that already? You said that already. Well then As Lance Russell would say, yes. old fashioned stem winder. Well, whatever it is, all of these words may apply to Cedric Alexander and Shelton Benjamin against Veer McMahon and Sanka. And they didn't even give Shelton and Cedric an entrance. They were joined in the ring, and the heels jump-started it and basically threw Shelton through the ropes to the floor where we never saw him again. It's like he fell into a manhole. I was writing fast forward. I didn't even know Sheldon was in this match. No, that's the thing. They were standing in a corner. Suddenly they jump started it. Boom. And they turn around and they just shit can him through the ropes. He goes down on the other side of the, the camera or the ring from the camera. And you never see, he never stands up again. And they hit a move on Cedric and then stood up and the referee checked Cedric and said, no, no match. He can't, he can't go on. And waved it off, and then they gave him another double-team move and stood up and luxuriated and glorified. And again, you never saw Shelton. He was thrown out of the ring into apparently a bottomless pit and never even got up to fucking wander off. And that was that. So Bray Wyatt's got him. Bray Wyatt has got... He's kidnapped Shelton Benjamin. If anybody's got the number of Rock Khan's lawyer, <laughs> we need to get a kidnapping charge set up. Anyway, well, it's time for our main event. And what a main event it was for the World Heavyweight Championship number three, Seth Franklin Rollins and Damian Priest. They set it up at the top of the program. None of the Judgment Day at ringside. It's going to be one-on-one. And did you notice, by the way, again, the WWE is on a roll. The arena was jammed. They had people all the way up in Hartford and all the way around to where the stage and the entranceway and et cetera blocks off the the view. And even then, it looked like some of them were behind. And I've been in that. But that's the building. Not only was it WrestleMania, what was it, with Lawrence Taylor and Bam Bam? Which number was that? Eleven. Eleven was in in Hartford in that building, but also that's where Brett and Sean had their pull apart in the bathroom, and Sean got the bald spot. And uh, it's it's a it's been there for a while, but it's a nice building anyway. It looked good, and it, there were people everywhere. It wasn't like constant lights and sets and grids and screens to where it it looked like an old time you know wrestling atmosphere. Anyway, they seemed to be into it also. They had the signs, the whole nine yards. And they gave this match time. There was 22 minutes left in the show with the bell. And they started hot, and they were starting to back and forth. And even this match, a minute to the break. Brian, do they show the complete on-court entrances and introductions for the NBA Finals and start the first quarter and go to break a minute into it with action going on? They wouldn't dare. So even for this match, but nevertheless, they gave it plenty of time, but it was spread over three segments. So when they came back, Priest stopped him out on the floor and got heat. And I think they went back and forth, and it was a very modern style match, but not only did they do a good job with it, but Priest, who would be the, the one the inexperienced one in this equation hung with it all the way. He didn't get lost. He didn't make any mistakes and they worked well together and they kept going back and forth and they would end up doing the big 
explosion and payoff of a spot, you know, to go to the break, like Priest catching him on a dive and face planting him on the desk. But then the only thing that, again, I just have to scream about because they were doing so good is finally they come back from that last break and they're fighting on the top turnbuckle and Seth hits a beautiful superplex off the top. Holy shit, boom, they both hit flat and bounced. And boy, and then they roll right up and both of them try to start doing that fucking stupid falcon arrow thing. What is a fucking falcon arrow anyway? Is an arrow sticking out of a bird's chest? <laughs> what? <laughs> What is it? I hadn't thought about the literal definition of the whole. What is a fucking falcon arrow? And why, when you've just taken this big flat back bump off the top rope, whether you've given it or taken it, it looked like a million dollars and boom, and there you could l- land and sell, but instead they roll right back up to their feet. And now Priest goes to pick Rollins up, and he's the one that got the superplex delivered to him. But then Seth blocks it and then picks him up and hits the the bump that's a third of the height and the force that he just fucking gave the guy that he didn't sell, but this time he sells it. What? And why are we mad at the Falcon? Anyway. Is there a bird that you are mad at? You know, the goddamn, the turkey buzzards are a nuisance this time of year. Turkey buzzards? You don't have turkey buzzards? I don't think so. The goddamn wingspan on those turkey buzzards is about 10 or 12 feet. Look them up. They'll carry a dog away if you let them. Anyway, so then they really started going into the big stuff, and they get numerous two counts back and forth. With, and they're, the people are into it, but they're not rushing through this. They're, they are selling some things. It's just, you know, sometimes they're not selling others. And then finally, what a fucking bump. After they go through some of these two counts, they end up on the floor and Seth gives the buckle bomb to Priest into the barricade. But he didn't get his arms over the top of the barricade. He threw him flat down on his ass on the floor and his back hit the barricade. And I'm like, God damn, that probably stirred memories of hemorrhoids past. And then as he throws Priest back in the ring, suddenly Finn is there at ringside. I guess he came through the people, and he nails a super kick to Finn, Seth does, and then goes back in, and Priest hits a big clothesline and choke slam and gets a two count. But then when he gets up, he sees Finn, and he says to Finn, Priest does, why are you here? Because they'd made the deal, see, before. And this is why I'm thinking that there's going to be more dissension out of this, because as soon as he looks and says, why are you here? Then he goes for the razor's edge, but his bad shoulder gives out. And Seth hits a couple of strikes and the curb stomp one, two, three. But then as Seth Franklin leaves, there's the face off between Priest and Balor in the ring. And then my DVR froze. Did they exchange any comments or just look at each other in a menacing fashion. That was all I saw. Apparently then more, more later on this, but it's a good match and priest is a top guy and they need those. I'm just, I'm just wondering again. I know it's a different show, but you got one, one group having strife in internally. I'd leave it at that for the, for the promotion especially since it's a top angle in the fucking company. Does Rollins feel like a world champion to you? No, it's not. Right now, I mean. No, because it's not that. And I mean, they did a great number for this show again. Raw's rocking too, as well as SmackDown, we'll talk about. But it's just, again, it's not the guy. It's the, it reminds me of when, Jerry Jarrett wanted to make the CWA world title. It wasn't at Billy Robinson or Austin Idol or Jerry Lawler couldn't be accepted as world champions. It, it was brand new and it was kind of, you could kind of tell we do, we need a belt. <laughs> and it's to me, this is still with Roman reigns, the guy, nobody else can be the guy and any kind of world champion 
universal champion, global champion, whatever descriptor you're going to use for it, you got to be the guy. Not guys. If you were going to turn one of them babyface, would you turn Damian Priest or Finn Bauer? Uh, uh, I don't think with Finn, he's just starting to kind of, as we've mentioned, get enjoyable in the judgment day as the as the wise ass with the whiny voice that can drop falls when needed because the other ones don't need to get beat right now. A uh, priest will be a good baby face, but he should be more of a top single heel first in, on this run before I think he becomes that. So I don't know that you turn either one of them. Maybe right. mommy, maybe mommy can play peacemaker and give them both a piece or two and they'll be peaceful. Oh, those are your words, not mine. And that was Monday Night Raw, not mine.